I'm Conrad Metcalf for the New York Building Performance Contractors Association, a 20 year old nonprofit trade association building a market for energy efficiency on behalf of its members and the New York populace. I also want to welcome you to this third webinar in our series to promote practical deployment of air source heat pumps. Today we will be covering key best practices for design, equipment selection, installation, uh, all of this based on installation inspections that were done by Tatum Engineering and then kind of branched out from there. Lots of ways that you can generate callbacks with air source heat pump installation, but that's not what we want. We want you to get it right the first time and that's quite possible as long as you are careful and diligent with your installation practices, uh, that's quite possible. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this webinar. That would be HeatSmart Tompkins. Brian Eden heads up HeatSmart Tompkins. And Brian, are you available today to say a quick hello? Uh, thanks, uh, Conrad. Uh, this is the first time I'm getting my one minute in the sun. I, take advantage of it. Uh, HeatSmart Tompkins is committed to achieving New York State's greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals by actively promoting energy efficiency and beneficial electrification. Today's webinar is the culmination of a two-year development process and a lot of effort by a few people. Uh, you know, thanks to both Conrad and John for their great help with this. This transition away from fossil fuel systems requires a massive build out of residential and commercial heat pumps. We all see, also need a well-trained workforce and able rapid expansion. Today's presentation and Saturday's hands-on workshop will highlight the errors that tend to undermine consumer confidence and how to avoid them. I would request that you please fill out the pre and post webinar surveys. I read them. They will assist us in developing uh, future programs. Finally, we're all set for the hands-on workshop training on Saturday. There was substantial demand for this event. And we, so we are committed to conducting a second training within the next month or so. We will keep those on our waiting list uh, informed as this plan develops. Back to you, Conrad. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, we do need to move along quickly here today. So I'd go, like to go right into introducing our instructor, John Harrod. John is the co-owner of Snug Planet a full service contractor based here in Ithaca, New York, that is always pushing the envelope on home performance. You can use that, John. I just wrote that. You can use it though. <laughs> so, John, uh, I, I wanna mention just before you start that we have that Q&A button at the, top, at the bottom of your screen for the attendees. Uh, we'll be answering your questions towards the end, but we're, uh, you can submit your questions at any time. Uh, as usual, there will be opportunities to share your thoughts in the chat window. I strongly encourage you to do that. And yes, I can't uh, stress, as Brian said, that you uh, complete the post webinar survey afterwards. This is how NYSERDA sort of determines whether we're on the right track. This is how Brian Eden determines whether we're on the right track. So uh, we'll send out that link to all attendees with John's uh, slide deck as well as. Uh, a link to the recording. So let's get this show on the road. John, take it away. Thanks, Conrad, and thanks, Brian. Um, our objectives today are to learn how to install air source heat pumps and dramatically reduce the number of uh, customer complaints and callbacks that we receive. Uh, we're gonna become familiar with the Northeast Energy Partnerships cold climate air source heat pump resources, including their uh, sizing and specif specification guide and their installation guide and the best practices that are contained in those. Um, we're gonna become familiar with the steps in designing and installing air source heat pumps and the best practices for design, installation, and maintenance. And in the process of this, we're gonna uh, get some uh, ideas for how to avoid uh, and troubleshoot some of the most common issues that we've observed in installations. Um, first, just a, a quick slide about why we're so excited about cold climate air source heat pumps. Uh, we really believe that these represent a very scalable path to decarbonizing our housing stock. Uh, they're incredibly flexible in their application. Uh, they can 
be very efficient and cost effective. They're especially cost effective when you're replacing uh, delivered fuels like oil or propane or electric resistance. And uh, they are relatively simple to install. The flip side of that is that they're also pretty simple to, uh, to mess up. And these systems, in part because they're so precisely engineered, can be pretty unforgiving when it comes to poor design and workmanship. Uh, some of the problems that we've uh, uh, gotten feedback on from customers uh, are, you know, poor temperature control, uh, more noise than they were expecting. Uh, we've uh, done some monitoring and, and read some reports and found that in order for these to achieve the efficiencies that they're rated at, they really have to be installed properly. And uh, what we want to try and avoid is getting into a cycle where you mess things up during the design and the installation phase and then get caught in the cycle of multiple callbacks which cut into your customer satisfaction and cut into your profits. And we also want to make sure that these systems perform well for a long time to come. So we're going to be looking at some things we can do to help that happen. I really want to emphasize that most of the problems that uh, we've encountered are due to contractor error. Uh, for the most part, these systems are very high quality. They uh, have very few manufacturing defects. And that the big opportunities here are to improve uh, application, meaning the, the design and specification of these products, uh, to really get the installations right, and then to make sure that we're not only instructing the end users in proper operation, but we have a good plan to maintain these systems and keep them running properly. Uh, I'm going to be covering a, a lot of content today, and I just wanted to make people aware of some great resources that are available. Uh, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, NEEP, uh, has produced these, these excellent guides to sizing and selecting air source heat pumps and also to installation. I, and we're going to be referencing these a lot. I uh, did my own take on some of these questions in an article I wrote for Building Performance Journal, and I'll also be sending that out along with the slide deck. And we're also going to be relying heavily on uh, manufacturers' uh, installation manuals and trainings. Uh, I'm most familiar with Mitsubishi and LG products, uh, but the uh, times that I've looked at materials from uh, Daikin and Fujitsu, there's an incredible amount of overlap. Most of the best practices that we're talking about are not manufacturer specific and they will carry over from one uh, manufacturer to another. So um, really a successful air source heat pump project starts at the design and specification stage. Uh, we want to make sure that we get really clear on what the end user is looking for, that we properly assess the building components going into the project, and that includes the building envelope, which is critical to uh, calculating the heating and cooling loads, but we also need to be able to assess the electrical service, and if we're going to be using existing ductwork, we need to be able to assess that. We want to make sure that we're thinking through different options for distribution and zoning so that we get the one that really uh, meets the customer's requirements. That we're selecting the correct uh, model and size uh, for the application. Uh, that we're doing a good job of choosing the proper locations for both the indoor and outdoor units. And that we're confirming the specification data that after we've made this design, we're going back and we're double checking to make sure that the equipment as designed, uh, and that combination of, of different indoor and outdoor units, line set lengths, and so on, is really going to deliver the uh, performance that we uh, need it to. It's really worth spending some time doing some active listening with the customer. They've called you in because they're interested in air source heat pumps, or maybe they've just called you in because they have a comfort problem or, or high energy bills. Uh, some of the questions that you want to explore at this stage is, are they looking for a full load solution, one that provides all the heating and cooling requirements for their house, or are they looking for a partial load solution, something might, that might help them reduce their reliance on a wood stove or might improve comfort in a bonus room or an addition that they haven't been able to uh, 
conditioned properly. It's worth talking to people about what their comfort parameters are. Uh, you know, some people, especially folks that have uh, been used to using a, a wood stove or a coal stove as their primary heat, are very used to having parts of the house a lot warmer than others. In some cases, they even like it. Uh, other people really want very even temperatures as they move from one room to the next. Noise and aesthetic considerations are important. Some people are much more sensitive to noise than others. Some people don't care that they have these uh, indoor heads on their walls and some people are, are dead set against it. And so getting that out in the open and really listening and making sure your design reflects what they're looking for is, is critical to uh, not only getting the sale, but to having a customer in the long run. And then as early as possible in the process, you wanna start having that conversation about budget and financing. These are not cheap systems, especially if they're done properly, uh, but there are excellent incentives available that we talked about in some of the previous webinars. And there's also financing that can uh, uh, bring it down to a reasonable monthly payment. And in some cases actually save more on energy bills than they're spending on the loan. One of the most critical uh, calculations you're gonna be doing at the design stage is the uh, heating and cooling loads. If the system is too small for the application, it's not gonna do the job and it's not gonna be able to maintain temperature under extreme conditions. But too big is also a problem too. Uh, a system that's oversized is going to cycle on and off more frequently. It may produce uh, temperature swings, poor comfort, and it's gonna result in a lot higher energy bills in the long run. So what we really wanna do is get our calculations dialed in so that we get this sizing just right. And the tool that we use to do that is uh, uh, manual J calculations. These are standardized by the uh, Air Conditioning Contractors of America. And like any kind of calculation like this, it's only as good as the data you put into it. The better the inputs, the more time you spend accurately measuring uh, the dimensions of the house, uh, assessing the insulation values, uh, and if you can run a blower door and measure the air leakage, all those things are gonna contribute to a lot more accurate results, which are gonna avoid the problems of a system that's either too small or too large. It's important to remember that the uh, ACA Manual J process builds in safety margins, so you don't need to uh, subjectively add in another 10 or 20% on top of those results, just to be sure. It's better to spend the time really making sure your inputs are right, uh, you'll get a better result that way. As we're doing more and more electrification of uh, homes that previously heated with fossil fuels, we're gonna need to get comfortable assessing the electric service and determining if we add the additional loads of heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and possibly other electric appliances like electric stoves and electric dryers, uh, does the existing electrical panel and service have enough capacity to support the new things we're going to be adding to it? And again here, we don't need to guess. There's a really well-established method. It's quite simple once you get comfortable with it. It's uh, from the National Electrical Code, Section 220.83, and it takes you through a set of calculations. Uh, the inputs that you put into this are the, the finished square footage of the house, uh, you tally up the general loads, which include things like uh, small appliance circuits, like uh, countertop and laundry circuits, uh, your fixed appliances, like your electric stove, dryer, electric water heater, and so forth. And then you apply a demand factor calculation, which uh, essentially accounts for the fact that not all these appliances are gonna be used simultaneously. You also factor in the heating and cooling equipment, either existing or what's proposed, and because those two aren't gonna be running simultaneously, you only have to use the larger of the two in those calculations. And, you know, we're doing more and more air source heat pumps that utilize the existing ductwork in the house. 
and we need to get comfortable evaluating can the existing ductwork handle the increased air flows that we're going to need with an air source heat pump. Uh, in our climate, especially upstate, we don't have a lot of houses that have central air. And so a lot of these duct systems were originally uh, designed around heating only applications. So they're only, uh, in those applications, you only needed to provide about, uh, you know, anywhere from 120 to 180 CFM per ton of heating. Um, heat pumps require a lot more airflow per BTU of heat. So with heat pumps, we're looking at 300 CFM per ton and up. So even though the heat pump that we're putting in is uh, typically smaller in output than the furnace that we're replacing, uh, we still may not have adequate airflow. And we may need to think about adding either additional supply runs or additional return capacity or upsizing the trunk. So you really need to go through and uh, assess this and use your duct calculator to uh, make sure that you've got enough capacity. Uh, you also need to think about space constraints. Uh, in our part of the state, we have a lot of these older houses that have uh, low ceiling basements. Uh, the new uh, vertical air handlers uh, that can swap out for a furnace are oftentimes relatively tall. And so you just need to make sure that you have enough uh, vertical clearance. You need to think about the location of the ductwork. Is it going to be running through an unconditioned space like an attic or a crawl space? Uh, and take those extra losses into account when you're sizing the system. Uh, and also think about what you can do to mitigate those uh, losses, uh, whether it's encapsulating the attic, uh, insulating the ductwork really well, and of course, making sure that it's well sealed. A lot of manufacturers in their literature will talk about zone solutions and you'll often see uh, graphics like the one in the, uh, uh, the upper right here, uh, where they've got heads in each room. Uh, this can be done. Uh, what we've learned uh, sometimes the hard way is that you're really better off not putting uh, individual ductless heads in small rooms, uh, in part because it means that no matter where you are in the room, you're, in, you're having that air blowing directly on you, whether it's, uh, you know, you're sitting in a chair, working at your desk, lying in bed, you've got this ductless head blowing right on you. Um, but an even bigger problem is that the smallest heads that are available are typically six or 7,000 BTUs, whereas the loads for these rooms might only be, you know, 2,000, 2,500 BTUs. So the heads are oftentimes really oversized for the rooms. And if you put one of these heads in each room, you end up uh, needing to connect them to an outdoor unit that then also ends up being really oversized. And even though it can modulate down to a certain degree, it can only modulate down so far. And so it, when you have just uh, you know, one or two of these uh, small zones calling for heat, that unit's gonna be cycling on and off a lot. It may be bypassing refrigerant through some of the other heads so you get unintentional heating in those areas that you don't want and you can also get noise complaints and of course if you're cycling on and off a lot it's just going to uh, tank the efficiency of the system. Uh, so when you're at this stage of thinking about how you want to uh, distribute the heating and cooling it's worth thinking about multiple options. Uh, yes we can use ductless heads. We might also want to think about using some of these uh, compact ducted units um, that you see uh, in the lower center on the, um, on the left side. Uh, these are designed to serve a, a limited amount of duct work. Uh, typically, you know, uh, a bedroom wing of a house or a, uh, a bedroom suite with an adjoining uh, bathroom and, and walk-in closet. Uh, that's a way to get around this issue of having uh, heads in every room. It also, um, allows you to avoid the aesthetic impact of having a, a ductless unit hanging on the wall. You can hide it in a, in a uh, conditioned attic, in a crawl space, uh, sometimes even in a, a mechanical closet. And more and more, we're starting to think about using central air handlers, like in the one in the, um, the lower left corner there, which can uh, essentially swap out for a furnace and 
uh, provide the heating requirements for the whole house if the ductwork uh, can handle those airflows. Um, this is just a slide I borrowed from an LG training, but it, it shows uh, a um, approach that they use to zone a, a sample house uh, where they used one of these compact ducted air handlers to serve uh, the bedroom wing and uh, a couple uh, ceiling cassettes to serve this uh, open floor plan central part of the house. And then another compact uh, um, air handler to serve the rooms that are around the, uh, the master bedroom suite. So there's lots of different options. And I think the important thing is to, to think through the plus and minuses of different uh, options and uh, try to come up with the one that, that best meets the customer's requirements. Um, yeah, so uh, this is an example of a uh, compact ducted unit that we did. Uh, this was to solve a problem very much like the one in the last slide. It was a uh, three bedroom ranch uh, with a open floor plan area. We used a high wall unit to uh, heat and cool that uh, open floor plan area, the um, living room and kitchen. And we used a compact uh, ducted system with Three, uh, three supply ducts and one central return in the hall to condition the bedroom wing. Very quiet, uh, very efficient because uh, you're, not, uh, you're matching the size of the unit more appropriately to the, the heating requirements of the room. It's also worth remembering that for rooms with very small loads, like bathrooms, for example, you can always use electric baseboard. And in the end, it may be a more efficient way to, uh, to handle those loads. So once you've uh, settled on design, you want to select the uh, model and capacity. Um, the NYSERDA programs want you to size whole house systems at between 90 and 120% of the manual J design load. Um, and uh, so that's a, that's a good general guideline. You want to take into account performance under local conditions. So you know, if you're downstate and your design temperatures are above zero, uh, you'll want to take that into account. And if you're up in the northern Adirondacks and you've got lower design temperatures, that's important to think about too. There is equipment that will work under all these situations, but you just want to make sure that you're spending the time to actually look up how your system is going to perform under local design conditions. Um, it's important to think about modulation range. You know, we oftentimes size systems based on the maximum output of the, uh, the unit, but it's also worth thinking about how far it can dial down. In general, all else being equal, uh, the greater the ability to dial down, the greater comfort and greater efficiency you're going to have. Uh, are you going to be incorporating backup heating into this system uh, with uh, the uh, vertical air handlers that is typically done with uh, resistance heat strips? Um, but there's other ways to do backup heating, whether it's um, electric baseboards or, you know, in some cases, a customer uh, is happy to fire up their wood stove on those really, really cold nights. Another uh, question that comes into play when you're designing is, do you want to have just a single outdoor unit or multiple outdoor units. And again, there's pluses and minuses to this decision. Uh, most customers, all else being equal, will prefer a single outdoor unit just because of the uh, reduced uh, space requirements and aesthetic impacts. But there are cases where you have a, uh, a um, you know, large house and it just may make a heck of a lot more sense to have two outdoor units at different ends of the house. And that way you can keep your line set lengths uh, within reason. Um, there are other cases where uh, choice of uh, multiple outdoor units may boost your efficiency. One of the things that uh, we find looking at the uh, specification manuals is that uh, single zone units, what we call the one-to-ones, tend to have a lot lower uh, minimum modulation range than the multi-zone units. And that means that uh, there are some places where 
uh, they will make more sense. It might make sense to say have a, uh, a one to one and a two to one rather than uh, running all three heads off a single outdoor unit. So these are some of the, um, the trade-offs. Uh, the other benefit of multiple outdoor units is that you have some redundancy so that if one of the units, one of the outdoor units goes down, uh, you still have some heat in the house. And then there are decisions about controls. Uh, do you want to just stick with the um, handheld remotes that come with the, uh, uh, the ductless heads or do you want to uh, have something more sophisticated, a communicating control, perhaps something that can be operated through your, uh, uh, your device, your um, phone or, or tablet. So there's lots of different uh, options here. And as you get more familiar with the individual manufacturers uh, and the options they offer, uh, you'll be able to uh, talk about these with, uh, with customers. Um, this is just a quick look at some of the extended uh, performance data that it's worth uh, considering. Um, this is for some Mitsubishi uh, cold climate units. And here you can see not just the rated BTUs. Uh, this is a, a nominal 18,000 BTU, 10 and a half system. Um, and you can see that it's rated capacity at, at 47 degrees. At 47 degrees, it can give you 30,000 BTUs of heat. Um, that's not really that important because no one really cares what it does at 47. It's all about what happens when it starts to get really cold. And you can see how that performance holds up pretty well uh, all the way down to five degrees Fahrenheit. Below that, you're still getting substantial amounts of heat even at minus 13 Fahrenheit. So getting familiar with these kind of extended uh, performance data is really important. You wanna pick um, good locations for your indoor and outdoor units. Uh, for outdoor units, we wanna think about visual impact, but we also wanna think about sound. And uh, you know, whenever possible, trying to keep these away from uh, areas uh, where sleeping or uh, quiet study is gonna be occurring. Um, you want to think about the proximity to the indoor units. Uh, manufacturers typically specify both a minimum uh, line set length, which is there, I think, largely to prevent noise, and a maximum line set length, uh, which is uh, the maximum that that particular unit uh, can handle in terms of moving refrigerant uh, without excessive uh, efficiency losses. You want to avoid uh, putting uh, these units uh, right under roof drip lines and um, in walkway areas where um, uh, summertime condensate or winter defrost might uh, create a, a slip hazard. Uh, when we're thinking about indoor units, we wanna think of course about visual impact. We wanna think about clearances. Uh, one of the things that's come out of some recent research is that high wall units are a lot more efficient if we can keep them at least six inches down from the ceiling. And that's because there's a very warm layer of air that hangs out right at ceiling level. Uh, by moving the units down six inches, you can get a lot better mixing and better heat exchange across the, uh, across the unit itself. Um, other things to think about at this stage are uh, what is the uh, the coverage and throw? So if you're designing a uh, a unit for a large uh, open floor plan area, does that unit have enough uh, oomph to get that air across 35 or 40 feet? And where are you going to uh, dispose of the condensate? These are all questions that you know uh, manufacturers are. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Salespeople ought to be thinking about so that they have these problems solved in advance and the, uh, the installers aren't left, uh, you know, scratching their heads uh, when they get to the job site. Branch boxes come into play on uh, larger systems and these need to uh, be located out of the weather, whether it's some kind of enclosed box or some kind of uh, uh, conditioned space. They basically just need to be protected from, from rain and snow. They don't necessarily need to be in a fully conditioned space. And then uh, the last and important uh, step in this uh, uh, design process is to confirm your specification data. So to double check to make sure that the combination of indoor and outdoor units uh, that you have 
in your design really do play well together, that they're all compatible, uh, that you are meeting the manufacturer's requirements for minimum and maximum line set lengths, that when you start to put together a system like this and you've got longer line sets, uh, you start to lose a little bit of capacity and that's uh, what's meant by the D rates. And so um, this is a, uh, something that you need to take into account. Uh, you can do this all by hand. Um, manufacturers are increasingly offering really great software tools. This is Mitsubishi's uh, Diamond Systems Builder, uh, which essentially double checks your equipment compatibility, uh, your line set lengths, and actually calculates your delivered BTUs and how much refrigerant you're gonna to need to add. So it saves you a lot of time and, uh, you know, avoids errors that uh, could occur. Okay, so to quickly run through some of the uh, highlights of the application process, always listen carefully and ask questions to the end users to make sure you're giving them what they want. Size the equipment as thoughtfully as possible. Don't assume that the existing ductwork or the electrical service are gonna be adequate. Do the calculations. Try to avoid installing ductless heads in small rooms. Always consider multiple solutions uh, before you settle on one. Think about minimum modulation levels when you're picking out your equipment and all else being equal, pick the one with the greater modulation range. And uh, do double check that the system uh, that you've designed is gonna work properly. Okay. So now we're moving on to installation, and uh, this is what we're going to be doing um, uh, hands-on on Saturday, is, is doing a, a full install of a, a single zone unit here at uh, our shop in Ithaca. Uh, the basic process is to confirm the locations with the homeowner, um, install the indoor unit first, then the outdoor unit, interconnect the system, meaning the uh, refrigerant lines, the electrical, the condensate, and so forth. Uh, do a very thorough leak test, and we're going to be talking in a little more detail about how to prevent refrigerant leaks because that is such a common callback and one that uh, can easily be prevented. Uh, you want to put the uh, refrigerant charge in the system and give it a test run. And then the point that so often gets lost is educating the end users in the proper operation and maintenance of the system. Um, so uh, the installer is gonna need to confirm locations, both to make sure that this is what the homeowner wants, but also to make sure that the salesperson uh, hasn't missed anything in terms of uh, maintaining proper clearance for the units. Um, sometimes uh, homeowners, um, once they actually see the unit, they, they may react differently than when they had it described to them, even if uh, uh, the salesperson really did their best to explain what they were gonna be getting. And we also just wanna double check that the outdoor unit, for example, when it's put up on its pad and its stand, that it's not gonna be blocking a window or it's not gonna create some other kind of uh, uh, visual um, issue. And again here, you're double checking for a lot of the things that hopefully would, were caught back at the design stage. But, you know, one of the lessons that we've learned, uh, unfortunately, more than once is that, uh, you know, <laughs> check twice, check three times, install once. And that's why a lot of what I'm talking about here involves checking, confirming, and so on. It's going to save you uh, time and money in the long run. Um, so installing the indoor unit is typically pretty straightforward. Uh, most of the high wall units start by uh, securing a, uh, a metal bracket. Uh, you want to locate the studs. Uh, you don't necessarily need to screw into a stud, but you need to know where the studs are so that when you drill your hole for your refrigerant lines and your condensate and wiring, uh, you find that you're not trying to go right through a stud. You also need to make sure that that hole is um, exactly where it's supposed to be and there are uh, guidelines right on this metal bracket that will uh, help you line that up. That it's pitched properly to the outside so that the condensate that forms in cooling mode drains properly to the outside. Um, and that it's perfectly level. 
so that you don't have problems with condensate building up and water running down your wall. Um, install the wall sleeve. That's a really critical piece that I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides. You typically are going ahead and attaching the control wiring before you even hang the head. It's a lot easier to do that when it's on the ground than when you're standing up on a ladder. And then finally, you want to make sure that you've uh, sealed the wall penetration. Um, this device here is the wall sleeve. And so, you know, to install the penetrations in the wall through which the uh, wiring, the refrigerant lines, the condensate lines run, you're typically drilling, um, uh, you know, two and five eighths or three inch hole in the wall. And you want to make sure that that's sealed up properly, both for efficiency, you don't want cold air infiltrating, you don't want insects, um, you really don't want moisture getting in there and uh, condensing when you're in cooling mode, and you don't want outside air coming into the back of the unit. The high wall units in particular have their temperature sensors uh, right in the unit itself, and so if you don't seal this hole properly, you're going to get outdoor air coming in through that hole and throwing off the room temperature readings, which can lead to a lot of uh, weird behavior, temperature swings, and uh, comfort issues. It's very hard to seal a wall penetration in a wall that has loose material like fiberglass or cellulose, unless you install one of these wall sleeves. And it's a, a telescoping plastic piece uh, that cost in the, the ballpark of, of $10. Um, and you adjust it to the thickness of the wall, run all your um, service lines through that, and then uh, when you're done, you fill it up with uh, um, one part foam and you've got a nice tight air seal. Um, for outdoor units, we want to make sure that they're installed level on solid ground. Uh, we typically put down uh, several bags of gravel. Uh, you want to make sure that they're elevated above the average maximum snow depth. Another reason to elevate the units is that in heating mode, they're going to be generating um, liquid when they go to defrost. And you want to make sure that that liquid can drain away freely. Otherwise, it can start to ice up the unit. Uh, in some extreme cases, it can even um, uh, burst the, uh, the outdoor coil just because of the, uh, the amount of ice buildup in there. Avoiding uh, drip lines and eaves is a really good idea. It's going to reduce uh, the amount of uh, you know, debris and, and, and water that falls on the unit. It's going to make it easier for it to defrost in the, in the wintertime. Um, in very high snow areas, uh, some people are recommending installing little uh, awnings over these systems. And I think that's a fine idea as long as it doesn't interfere with um, uh, airflow. Another thing that we're uh, occasionally having uh, recommended to us is to consider uh, what are called low ambient baffles on windy sites. Uh, these were originally designed to help these units do a better job of cooling places like server rooms that need cooling year round um, and to function properly when you're trying to cool under very cold outdoor conditions. But one of the things that uh, has been reported is that very high winds can cause the fans on these outdoor units to spin backwards. When they spin backwards, they send a uh, electrical pulse back through the electronics of the unit and in some cases have apparently uh, fried the circuit boards. So that's something to consider on, on um, really windy sites. Uh, one thing we've learned the hard way is that whenever possible, we don't want to install uh, these units on wall brackets on wood frame walls. Uh, part of the way that these systems get their efficiency is by having a, a variable frequency compressor. And when you start to vary that frequency, invariably you're going to find a, uh, a frequency that resonates with the, uh, the wood siding and creates a lot of, uh, of unpleasant vibration and noise. So uh, these wall brackets work great when you're tying into masonry walls. If your only option is a wood wall, you're much better off installing a, a ground mount. So once you've got the indoor and the outdoor units in place, you can interconnect the system. Uh, there are the line sets and uh, line set covers. 
uh, the wiring, including both the, uh, the line voltage wiring and the control wiring that goes between the indoor and the outdoor units, and then making sure that you're dealing with the condensate. Um, most cold climate air source heat pumps, uh, the refrigerant connections are done with flares. And uh, essentially these are uh, mechanical metal on metal seals. Uh, if they're done properly, they can be very durable and, and leak free, but they're also easy to mess up. And so it's worth really spending some time uh, perfecting your flaring technique and uh, taking the time to make sure that every flare is done properly. Uh, you want to use a good quality uh, tubing cutter. I have one tubing cutter that I use for cutting up scrap metal, another one that I use only when I'm uh, uh, cutting copper to flare for, uh, for heat pumps. You want to get a nice square cut and you want to do it slowly so that you don't bend the tube out of round. And then you want to carefully remove the um, little lip of copper that forms inside that wall while you're cutting. But you want to make sure that you keep your tubing pointing downward so that any metal shavings don't fall back into the line where they can clog, uh, clog strainers and, and valves and things like that. Uh, there are some uh, various options that are available for flaring tools. Uh, the important thing is to get a good quality flaring tool that's designed to be used with R410A systems. Uh, the one that I use is the one here on the um, left. Uh, it's a um, uh, eccentric cone that uh, spins around uh, and uh, gradually uh, presses the copper into the, the proper uh, shape. It has a depth gauge so that you know that it's um, forming exactly the right dimensions and a clutch so that you don't over tighten and, uh, and um, uh, destroy the, uh, the flare. Uh, people have also said very good things about these um, uh, um, cordless uh, flare tools. Uh, these spin a lot faster and so not only do they form the flare, they actually anneal the copper, which makes it less uh, vulnerable to cracking. And I've heard that uh, these are a way for a person with, you know, very uh, entry level experience can consistently make good flares. So you want to make sure you're taking the time to visually inspect the flare. Uh, it needs to be perfectly round and symmetrical. Uh, it needs to cover the flare cone, but not be so big that it catches on the uh, threads of the flare nut. Uh, you want that surface to be shiny so that it um, makes good contact with the flare cone all the way around and that you're not seeing any gouges or other kind of defects. And the same thing with the cone. You want to make sure it's clean and free of scratches and that you're aligning the flare onto the flare cone properly before you start to tighten down the nut. Uh, I am a strong believer in using some kind of uh, assembly lubricant when you're making your flares. Uh, this should be either PoE oil, refrigeration oil, or a product uh, called Nylog, which is designed specifically for this application. It's compatible with uh, refrigerants, refrigerant oils. Um, this makes it a lot easier to uh, hand tighten the flare nut into place before you put your wrenches on it. Uh, you also want to put a, a, a little bit of this on the back of the flare so that the nut can spin freely as it's being tightened down. Um, and uh, it's been my experience that uh, use of Nylog is what I use, uh, definitely improves the seal and reduces the likelihood of leaks. It is really critical to use torque wrenches. Um, you know, many uh, kind of old school techs will swear that they're their wrists are precisely calibrated to get just the right amount of torque. There's no way that that can be true on a consistent basis. If you look at this little uh, chart, which uh, comes with this uh, set of uh, um, torque wrenches, you'll see that for smaller copper lines, you only need a torque of about 13 foot pounds. That's for quarter inch lines, the typical um, smaller line in a um, air source heat pump. But when you get to these larger 3 8 lines, you're up to 30 foot pounds, half inch lines, 43 uh, foot pounds, and 5 8 56. So there's a, there's a huge range. And if you don't use a torque wrench to calibrate your tightening, you're going to end up with flares that are either too loose and they leak, 
or flares that you tighten down too hard and that's really easy to do on these smaller lines and you crush the flare and then it's gonna leak. So uh, using the torque wrench is the way to get these uh, just right. And this alone is gonna uh, dramatically reduce the amount of problems that you have. Um, a couple other tips here. If you test a flare and find that it's leaking, you, um, you gotta redo it. You can't fix it by tightening it down harder. Um, and this picture here showed what happened when one of my techs, uh, someone who's, who's no longer working with me, but um, this is what happened. He decided that he had a little leak. He was just gonna really crank down that, that flare nut and he snapped that, uh, that um, brass flare right off uh, and uh, we lost all the charge. Uh, the other thing I noticed when I was looking at this picture today was this gray stuff, this gray gummy stuff on these flares, that's not nylog and that's not uh, PoE oil. That is another material called leak lock, um, which is used in other refrigerant applications, but this is not something you ever want to use when you're uh, flaring. Uh, if you're buying pre-flared line sets, cut off the factory flares. They're just not consistently good and there's too high a chance that uh, they've been damaged in tra transit. Make your own flares. Always use the uh, original manufacturer's flare nuts uh, when you can. Um, they're made to a higher standard of, of metallurgy and uh, they're also a lot beefier than the aftermarket flares that you get so that uh, you know, the torque specs are designed for the, the size and the thread of the, uh, the flare nuts that they provide. Um, and one last thing here, uh, sometimes you will see uh, on multi-head units that you have um, multiple ports and sometimes the size of the units, uh, the line sets from the, uh, the indoor units will be different than some of the ports. So you need to double check your literature, make sure that you've got a uh, allowable combination, but then you always wanna use the line set size that's coming off the indoor head and do your uh, uh, reducer or increaser right here at the unit. Um, you wanna make sure that your line set insulation is very thorough. Um, this is partially for efficiency, but even more importantly, when you start to get into the indoor uh, side of things, uh, poor line set insulation can lead to condensation and mold. So be very thorough with your, your line set insulation. Uh, you are interconnecting the electrical components of the system. So uh, there's always an outdoor disconnect that runs back to the electrical panel. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're properly sizing uh, all your line voltage wires uh, going into the manufacturer specs, uh, which will tell you um, the MCA, the minimum circuit ampacity. Uh, that's what dictates the size of wire that you want to use for your line voltage. And then the MOCP, the maximum overcurrent protection, that's what tells you uh, the maximum size of breaker that you're allowed to use. Um, you want to make sure that uh, the disconnect is, is easily accessible from uh, the outdoor unit. And you want to make sure that all the um, line voltage wiring is, is safely enclosed in uh, outdoor rated conduit. Um, you can't run Romex inside conduit. You can only run um, individual conductors, uh, THHN is, is what it's referred to. So it's the, um, you know, the wires that are inside Romex. Uh, but you can also buy them as separate uh, connectors. But don't run Romex inside the uh, conduit. It's not rated for that. Um, it's important to think about surge protection as something you might want to offer uh, your customers, especially in areas where they do have uh, um, variable power quality. It can protect your circuit boards. Uh, the control wires, uh, these run from the uh, the outdoor unit to the indoor unit. And typically the power at the indoor unit is provided from the outdoor unit. So you've got uh, what's typically a three wire system, uh, two legs providing 240 volt power, uh, alternating current, and a third leg that's um, uh, providing a control signal that's a direct current signal. So this is a, um, I, I would always, uh, I've always wanted to talk to the person that came up with this control strategy because it's pretty uh, ingenious in that you can get power and uh, 
control in just three wires, but it is very sensitive to wire gauge. So you want to make sure you're always using the wire gauge that's recommended by the manufacturer. Unlike um, line voltage wiring, where it's okay to go to a larger gauge, there's no harm in it other than the extra cost of the copper. With control wires, if they specify 16 gauge wire, don't bump that up to 14 gauge because the signals may not uh, transmit it properly and you'll end up with communication errors and callbacks. Um, you always want to use outdoor rated wire um, for those applications and if you can avoid splicing that wire, again it's going to help uh, get a better communication signal. Um, it's very important to pitch your condensate lines properly with no uh, reverse uh, grades, no traps, and to terminate them properly so that they can drip freely to the ground. Um, on cases where you can't do this reliably, you want to use a condensate pump. And there's different ways to do this. There are a number of aftermarket pumps that are designed to go with uh, many splits. Um, most of them are, are tied directly into the control wiring so that if they fail, the uh, head will not operate and you won't end up with a, uh, a water uh, crisis. All right, so you've got your system interconnected. Now you're going to leak test it. Uh, I'd say that the um, probably the single most common callback for uh, cold climate heat pumps is due to refrigerant leaks. People report that the system isn't heating or cooling or that it's kicking an error code. Uh, so these are a major source of callbacks. Uh, refrigerants are potent greenhouse gases. And so, you know, if we're talking about doing a lot of this to try and protect the climate, we don't want to undo all the good work we've done by allowing refrigerants to leak out. Uh, the majority of these leaks can be prevented by good flaring technique, good uh, use of torque wrenches, but then thorough testing. And uh, what I've kind of um, come to is that if you do these four tests in order correctly, you will have eliminated the vast majority of, of refrigerant leaks. First, you want to do a standing pressure test at 500 PSI with dry nitrogen. Um, some manufacturers are going to recommend a 24-hour pressure test. I personally believe that you're okay with a much shorter pressure test as long as, you know, you pressurize the system, you give it a few minutes to stabilize. It shouldn't lose a single PSI in that 45-minute test. But at the same time that you're uh, running that standing pressure test, you also want to bubble test all your joints. That's going to be a much more sensitive indicator of a, of a tiny um, hairline leak. So you want to put that bubble solution on every flare and give it a few minutes. Uh, check back to make sure that you're not uh, forming bubbles. If you pass those two tests, it's time to uh, vacuum down the system. And the main purpose of evacuation is to get uh, air and moisture out of the lines before you put the refrigerant in to protect your compressor from uh, the negative effects of, of those. But this um, uh, vacuum provides another opportunity to test for leaks. And there's a specific test called a vacuum decay test, which is after you vacuumed your system down below your 500 micron target, you valve it off, you turn off your, uh, um, uh, your vacuum pump, and you watch what happens to the vacuum. And if you vacuumed it well down below 500, microns, valve it off and let it stand for 10 minutes and it's still under 500 microns, there's, you know, one more indication that you've got a nice tight system and you're ready to go ahead and release the refrigerant charge. There's one more test that I, is often skipped that I think uh, can catch a few more leaks and that's to go back through at the end once the refrigerant's in the system and double check not only your flares, but also your service valves and your Schrader core, the things that you weren't able to check during the standing pressure test. Use an electronic leak detector and uh, just, just double check those. Um, so a lot of the systems that we install uh, are gonna fall within the pre-charge uh, amounts for the heat pumps, meaning there's enough uh, refrigerant shipped in the outdoor unit that you won't, won't need to add any additional refrigerant. Uh, but 
for some systems with longer line sets and for all systems that involve a branch box, you're typically going to have to add some trim charge. Um, so it's important to know the line set lengths. Uh, these factor into the calculations. Each manufacturer has you do it a little bit differently. But basically, you are figuring out how much more line set you have than the pre-charge length and what the diameter of those line sets are. And uh, adding refrigerant charge, weighing it in based on those calculations. Um, you cannot charge uh, cold climate heat pumps using superheat or subcool the way you could with uh, older, um, you know, fixed speed uh, air conditioners and heat pumps. You really have to weigh things in. And you want to make sure that when you've done that, you properly record the trim charge that was added. I like to write it in Sharpie on uh, the inside of the access panel on the outdoor unit and also uh, write it down on the notes that, that come back and go into our, um, our uh, database. Okay, so you've got the system properly charged, get the con controls configured, and then do a test run. Make sure everything is operating properly. Uh, check the, um, the delta T on the system, uh, the temperature change across the coil. If you've got a ducted system, you definitely need to measure your airflow and your static pressure. And uh, there are some great tools available now that can allow you to actually measure the BTU output of the system directly, uh, the delivered capacity measurement. Uh, I don't have time to really dig into that today, but um, it is going to be in, in one of the articles that I send out. All right, so a critical piece of the install is the end user education. And, you know, ideally we're educating customers all along from the first interaction uh, through sales, uh, installation, and service. And it's really important to do this because if the customers aren't operating these systems properly and they don't know what to do to maintain them, they're not going to function well and they're not going to last as long as they could. Uh, what I've found in general is that installers are not necessarily great educators. And so what I've tried to do to make this easier for them and also to help the customers have a, a reference to go back to that's a little more readable than the, um, you know, the, the 20 page install manual is to have a one page quick guide that goes over the, um, the basic operation of the system and the basic maintenance of the system and the way that we recommend that it be used. Um, so, you know, we're not trying to describe every option available in this system. We're trying to help the customer get comfortable with the basic operation and also to avoid doing things like using deep temperature setbacks that are going to hurt your efficiency and, and hurt your comfort. We really are trying to steer people towards a set it and forget it approach towards, uh, towards temperature settings. Um, this also talks about what to expect in terms of uh, cleaning your filters and uh, that we will reach out to them to schedule their first annual service. So it uh, you know, provides a nice transition from the install into the, uh, the customer for life um, uh, service relationship. So uh, just um, a few quick application highlights. Actually, I'm gonna breeze through this because I know we're tight for time. Um, In fact, I'm just gonna, just gonna, you know, anyone who wants to come back to these can check them out and move on to operation and maintenance. So um, something that we need to really emphasize to people is that they need to clean the filters on these systems. We've seen this over and over, especially in houses where for some reason there's, there's some kind of high dust load, whether it has to do with pets or hobbies or whatnot. Um, the simple filters on these systems can very rapidly become clogged and then the performance tanks and ultimately the operation just uh, just stops. So we want to make sure people are doing their uh, their regular filter cleaning but also that they get on the schedule for a regular annual maintenance. Um, that includes a deeper cleaning of the uh, not just the filters but also the um, the indoor and outdoor coils uh, the blower wheel um, may not be an every year thing, but it, it certainly should be cleaned as needed. Um, we really want to make sure that we're checking the, the condensate uh, 
system during this annual maintenance because if that starts to leak, that's going to be a big problem. Uh, do a quick operational test, make sure everything's working properly, and check in with the homeowner about how uh, things are going for them and if they have any questions. Um, diagnosing these systems can be a little challenging. Uh, they are a lot more complicated than your uh, uh, old style AC and heat pumps, which are, you know, kind of very deterministic systems. These have a lot of electronics and a lot of algorithms in them. Um, but some of the basic principles still apply. Problems can be related back to airflow, uh, charge, um, electrical issues, control issues, and, and operator error. And so figuring out which of these uh, is, is the problem is, is going to get you started in the right direction. Uh, you should also be very familiar with um, Diagnosis, diagnosis manuals and have the uh, um, uh, the service hotline on on uh, your your quick dial. Um, we're really trying to steer people away from hooking up gauges to these systems, and part of that is because of the complex algorithms. Hooking up gauges doesn't provide a lot of useful information, but equally important. These are critical charge systems, so they can't be, you know, the refrigerant charge can't be adjusted by superheat or subcool. The only way to ensure that you've got a proper charge is to um, recover all the refrigerant in the system, weigh it, and then put it back in, adding whatever you need to add to bring it up to the correct factory charge plus the calculated trim charge. But each time you hook up gauges to a system, you lose a little bit of refrigerant. Some comes out while you're uh, attaching to the Schrader core, and some ends up trapped in your gauges themselves and, and in your uh, hoses. So if we can uh, avoid that at all, um, if at all possible, we're going to um, avoid this kind of uh, chronic uh, loss of refrigerant from these systems that's ultimately going to impact their operation. So this is an approach that I've been advocating for. Um, uh, this will be described in more detail in an article that I'll, I'll send out. But we're basically using non-invasive testing, where we're using things like uh, thermohygrometers and apps that will help you determine whether your system is functioning properly and you know, allow you to rule out a refrigerant problem uh, rather than hooking up gauges to the system. Uh, there are also great diagnostic tools that are starting to become available. Um, this is a little device that, that LG has that hooks into their heat pumps and essentially transmits a, um, a signal to your smartphone. And you can read out all kinds of uh, information from the sensors in the system. You can read out error codes. Uh, I think this is going to be a great tool going forward. And I think we're going to see more and more of these uh, showing up in, uh, in cold climate heat pumps. So just a few quick highlights. We want to always make sure that when we're thinking about operation and maintenance, we are being proactive in scheduling regular maintenance, uh, that we are making sure that we're thoroughly cleaning um, heat exchangers, uh, blower wheels as needed, and always the condensate drains as part of that maintenance. Um, we want to avoid hooking up gauges if at all possible and instead use non-invasive diagnostic tools. Um, so here is a list of uh, resources. This will be uh, uh, in the slides that are sent out. Uh, these NEEP guides are fantastic. Uh, this is a really eye-opening um, uh, study that was uh, done by folks at Stephen Winter Associates that explains how they figured out why it's so important to um, bring your, uh, your high wall units down from the ceiling and why some heat pumps were performing at very low coefficients of performance and others were performing a lot better. It's a really, uh, really interesting read. Um, you will find great information on uh, manufacturers' websites. A lot of it is not behind any kind of uh, login or paywall. And um, uh, I've been trying to do more writing about these subjects as well and just share some of the, the hard, <laughs> hard uh, one knowledge that I've, I've gained about these. So I'll be sending these articles out. Um, Conrad mentioned we are doing a one-day field training this Saturday 
Uh, we have made this a very small training, uh, only eight attendees, so that folks could actually get their hands on flaring tools and torque wrenches and vacuum pumps and things like that. Um, this one is filled up. We are seeking out funding uh, and, uh, and potential sites to do more of these in the future. And with that, I am going to open things up to questions. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much, John. Can you uh, just scroll back to, you had a couple slides that you skimmed over that was kind of a summary of do's and don'ts. The application highlights here? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's a, that's a good thing for people to see and it just reinforces. And then the next screen you even were a little faster moving. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I saw the clock and I started to, to get a little yeah. nervous. No, I, and I get that. We have a bunch of questions, so I'm going to jump right into those. Um, uh, let's uh, talk about a system with multiple heads. And uh, I, I assume that you cannot have some in heating mode and some in cooling mode, as my wife would like in our house, correct? That is correct. And this is a conversation we've had with, with multiple customers. If you really, truly want to heat one part of the house and cool another part of the house, you're going to need either two, uh, two outdoor units so that you can run them in different modes, or you'll need to think about a, um, what's called a VRF system, variable refrigerant flow, which is kind of uh, a style of air source heat pump that's used in commercial and multifamily applications that will allow you to essentially move heat from one part of the building to another. Uh, very good. Are there any heat pumps out there with air handlers attached that can be retrofitted into a high velocity ductwork? That is a good question. That is not something I've done a lot of, but I know that um, you know there are there are areas where there are a lot of those um, you know Unico and Space Pack high velocity systems out there and. Uh, I, I just don't know if there's a, um, a cold climate heat pump that will work with us. Okay, fair enough. Um, how often do you install air source heat pumps without any kind of backup heating system? Yeah, um, I think that the answer to that kind of depends on what you mean by um, backup heat. I, I think, uh, uh, we do it. It's a conversation that you need to have with the customer that if this system goes down, are you okay heating with space heaters for a couple of days? Um, because, you know, unlike a lot of gas furnaces, you may have to special order parts. We really would like to see people have some kind of uh, backup heating source, whether it's, um, you know, electric baseboard that still requires, a, you know, power grid or a generator. Um, wood stove, uh, a, um, you know, propane wall heater, something like that. Um, especially, especially houses that, uh, that aren't as well insulated and so don't have that kind of passive um, survivability that you'd get in a really well insulated house. Very good. Um, you spoke about surge protectors. Um, how often do, do you install surge protectors? Is that is that a critical thing? It's something I would like to start doing more of, honestly. I, I think it's a, a good proactive thing. Uh, in the area that we work in, we're mostly in NYSEG territory, and we seem to have really good power quality. Uh, we have not lost any electronics in any, we've got you know a couple hundred systems out there, and we have not lost any electronics to power searches. Um, um, there's other parts of the country where uh, your power quality is a lot worse and I think it's, it's a lot more critical. So I think that's going to be kind of a case by case, but I also feel like it's, it's relatively um, cheap insurance. You're talking about a, um, you know, it's a, a 50 to $75 part that attaches to the disconnect and could potentially save a, you know, a, a several hundred dollar uh, circuit board. Very good point. Um, we're, and, and how does a generator stack up? One of those $10,000 Generac uh, systems 
that I would assume people might think of that as a backup. How does that stack up in terms of the electronics, uh, the surge protection requirements? Yeah, I mean, I would assume that they would they would go up. I, I would. We actually don't deal with a lot of houses with um, backup generators, but I think there'd be some important questions about power quality and where in that system you have your your protection from, you know, weird voltages. Right. Yeah. Still only a seventy five dollar part. Even if you if you just spend ten thousand dollars on a generac, seventy five dollars doesn't seem like a big deal. Right, but you might actually want to put your surge protection upstream uh, closer to the, the generator so that you, um, you know, you're protecting more, more, more things than just, house. right, very good. Okay, is there a particular bubble solution that is required for leak tests? <laughs> you just um, use uh, Joy or is it uh, something better? <laughs> yeah. Um, so you want to use a, you know, a um, leak solution that is, is rated for leak detection. You're not mixing up, uh, you know, dish soap. Um, and that's, that's because it has to be the right consistency. And, um, you know, we use a lot of refrigeration technologies products, and they will actually include in their literature, you know, these are rated to detect leaks down to whatever, 0. 0.5 ounces a year. Um, so it's not, you know, it's something that, you know, you buy it by the, um, the quart or the gallon and it lasts you a long time and it pays for itself the first, first leak you catch essentially. Oh yeah, very good. Uh, next question. What is the life expectancy of a good flare? How long might one last before expecting a leak under uh, best circumstances? Yeah, um, everything that I've uh, read and experienced is that you should expect a properly made flare uh, to last as long as the equipment itself. So, you know, in that, that 15 to 20 year time frame. That being said, you know, um, systems do lose refrigerant and if you encounter a system that's low on refrigerant, you are gonna need to do a thorough leak check and you may end up redoing a flare. Right, I get it. Um, to determine trim charge, do you use the length of the gas and the liquid lines together or just one or the other? Which is it? So it's, it's based on the length of the, um, the liquid line okay. and also uh, the diameter of the liquid line. And okay. some manufacturers also have you calculate into this the um, the BTU capacities of the various heads that are attached and add an additional factor for that. Oh, very good. Okay, here's an interesting idea. Have you ever installed an outdoor unit in a basement to draw heat from the concrete walls and the floor? Yeah. <laughs> you, can't really, you, know. you, you can't you can't do that. It's um uh the outdoor units move thousands of, of CFM of air and extract a little bit of heat uh, from all of those. If you were to do that in um, heating mode, you'd, you'd rapidly cool your, your basement down to a very cold temperature. Um, so uh, you, really, you really need that, that constant um, outdoor temperature for it to work properly. Okay, good point. Not constant, but I mean, you, let, you know, free airflow through the system. Right, right. I get it. Okay. Uh, do any of the mini split heat pumps have refrigerant monitoring that shows the refrigerant pressures without gauges? This is something I've been hoping for for a long time. And it appears that uh, some of the latest generation of LG, uh, the ones that were shown in that um, like uh, this, uh, this LG Sims tool uh, can read out refrigerant pressures on the systems that do have pressure monitors built in. And not all of them do, but I think we're starting to see that. Okay. Um, can you give us a definition of trim charge? 
Right. Um, so a, uh, a system, uh, a heat pump comes shipped from the factory with uh, a certain amount of factory charge. And that, you know, will be sufficient for installations that include up to a certain number of feet of line set. Uh, so, you know, a typical length might be, uh, say, 25 feet of line set. If the line sets are longer than 25 feet, you have to add a certain number of ounces per foot beyond that. And that extra amount that you're adding is, is the trim charge. Ah, okay. Very good. Um, how can you tell when there is a refrigerant leak? And, and this is maybe a question, how does a homeowner know if there's a refrigerant leak, but also as an installer, how would you know? Right, so there's a number of, of different uh, indications that you, you would have that. Um, you know, there might be some visual indication. A leaking flare will sometimes show, uh, you know, an oil streak um, near it. Uh, you'll have some issues with the performance of the system. If the charge gets really low, you'll have uh, inadequate heating and cooling. Uh, because of the variable speed nature of this system, they can compensate up to a point. You lose efficiency, but you might not lose capacity until uh, the refrigerant gets really low. Um, uh, but ultimately, it will impact that. And then um, you can also uh, locate these leaks uh, in an installed system using either a bubble solution or an electronic leak detector. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and some systems will also have, uh, you know, error codes that, you know, they, they won't say low refrigerant charge necessarily, but they'll say something like, you know, uh, uh, you know, discharge temperature too high or something like that, that, that we've come to associate with, with uh, uh, low refrigerant. Okay, very good. Uh, we have a couple more questions here. Do you have your technicians check flare fittings with a torque wrench during service calls? Uh, if it's not a reported problem or uh, they don't suspect a problem with the refrigerant? No. Um, Maybe on the first that. annual service? Yeah, I'm trying to think how that would work. Um, Typically, the, the torquing of the flares is, is only done during installation time. or repair. Um, it's not something that I, I'm not familiar with, with going back and rechecking with a, with a torque wrench. Okay. Yeah, I get that. Okay. Uh, and uh, we have a question uh, for uh, your basic explanation of the charge in the heat pump. Can you give a, a quick basic definition of that? Right, so the um, material that carries heat from the indoor to the outdoor unit uh, and which direction that, that heat is moved depends on whether it's in heating or cooling mode um, is, is a refrigerant. It's a gas, it's a uh, um, chlorofluorocarbon uh, that has a, a boiling point that varies depending on the pressure that it's under so that it can boil uh, and absorb heat or condense and release heat and which it does uh, at what temperatures depends on the pressure. So the charge is is just the amount of refrigerant that's in the system. You get it? That's a great explanation. Uh, at what temperature does a heat pump system uh, become less efficient? And, uh, and at that temperature, you might change from electric uh, heat pump to your backup gas or oil system. Is there a, a basic uh, rule of thumb for that? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the older generation of heat pumps, um, their, their effectiveness dropped off dramatically uh, when you got below about 40 degrees. And so, um, you know, you would do these balance point calculations and you'd have a you know, thermal balance point at which the heat pump could no longer meet the heat load of the house. 
but you'd also have an economic balance point, which is where, um, because of the dropping efficiency, it became more effective to switch over to gas or oil. Mm -hmm. um, these systems, these, these cold climate heat pumps are, are much better at maintaining their efficiency at cold temperatures. So in order to get on the NEEP list, you have to have a, a coefficient of performance of, of 1.75 at five degrees. So you're still um, producing uh, basically two kilowatt hours worth of heat for each kilowatt hour of electricity you use at five degrees. Um, most of the time in our, uh, in our heating season, we're spent at warmer temperatures, you know, in the, the teens, 20s, and 30s, where these have much higher uh, coefficients of performance, um, you know, anywhere from, you know, two and a half up to, to even four or above at, at mild temperatures. Um, so uh, we're not typically doing this kind of uh, balance point calculations on these cold climate heat pumps. Uh, they're generally... Uh, they're generally not needed and you always are going to be producing uh, you know a coefficient of performance above one uh, with these systems all the way down to the very coldest temperatures we're, we're getting in these regions okay very good do you ever test to 650 pounds per square inch yeah um we typically are doing our standing pressure test at at somewhere between 500 and 550 PSI. Um, the maximum level that's recommended is gonna vary with manufacturer. Um, I would say that, you know, uh, we've, we've had very good success with that 500 to 550 PSI range. The important thing though is to do the test and to be really diligent with the bubble solutions. I have a lot more confidence uh, in the bubble solutions uh, in finding the leaks than in the, um, you know, the small amount of change that you might get in your gauges. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, a couple more questions. Have you ever done an air to water system or are you doing those? Yeah, so I have not. Um, Tatum Engineering did a very uh, uh, detailed study on this. They have a nice white paper, which I believe you can download through their website looking at air to water heat pumps. And um, what they found is that, you know, the, the big limitation with these in retrofit applications is the water temperatures that they supply. If you're trying to retrofit hot water baseboard that was designed for 180 degrees, but you're only able to supply water at 130 degrees, you may have to do something different with the distribution system. You may have to add some radiant tubing, you may have to add panel radiators. Um, now we're up here in climate zone six. I've talked to folks that are down in the city in climate zone four who are very enthusiastic about air to water heat pumps. So I think that that technology is, um, it's evolving rapidly and I suspect in the next five years, it's, we're gonna see a lot more of it. Great, um, I think this may be the last uh, question we have. Uh, you have exactly uh, three minutes to answer it. And, and I know you talk, uh, I, I know you're very interested in alternative refrigerants. And I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about what's out there and what we should be looking for in the near future. Yeah. Um, so this is a really interesting uh, question and um, uh, so, you know, our current uh, generation of refrigerants was replacing an older generation of, you know, R22 uh, because of its lower ozone depleting potential. And the R22s were replacement for an even older generation that had a much uh, higher level of damage. Uh, our current R410A uh, has uh, pretty much zero ozone depleting potential, but it's still a really potent greenhouse gas. And so we're looking at um, uh, other options. Um, one that has come up is R32, which is actually a component of, uh, of R410A. It has a, a, it's the lower global warming potential half of, of R410A, but it has some flammability uh, when it's in its pure form. So uh, there's some safety and regulatory issues there. 
Um, another one that has been mentioned is R46, R466. R-466, um, <laughs> um, another one that is, is also a, uh, a CFC type refrigerant, I believe that um, has lower global warming potential. Uh, as we look 10 or 15 years down the line, we're gonna start seeing, I think, more uh, use of carbon dioxide as a refrigerant, which of course has uh, global warming potential of just one. Um, but those systems run at a lot higher pressures and uh, there's other design constraints. They're currently being used successfully in um, a split system um, uh, heat pump water heater, the Sandin water heater, uh, but not in uh, space heating heat pumps in our area. Sorry, I was talking while I was muted. Uh, we are at six o'clock. Um, and I know that Brian would like to uh, have a final word. I just want to thank you so much, uh, John, for your time today and for all the energy that you're putting into uh, not only uh, reducing carbon emissions, but uh, making uh, the world a better place for homeowners and energy efficiency contractors. Um, and I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, push this over to Brian for uh, a final comment. Uh, Conrad out, thank you all. So, um, since we started promoting these uh, webinar series, we've been receiving a lot of uh, comments from folks that are registered. And, uh, you know, not everything was covered in this uh, session. We only had three webinars and it was limited amount of times. There's some issues that need to be discussed and uh, that were not discussed here, but we're always walking, welcoming more comments and suggestions. So just because the webinar series is over, don't stop communicating with us. We like to maintain the relationships we've established over this period of time. So thank you very much for participating. I think we've done a lot to uh, advance our work and we're gonna continue to do this and, uh, and especially to John and Conrad for all their contributions to this. And uh, please stay tuned to uh, future activities that we're planning in this uh, realm. So thanks again. Thank you, Brian, and thanks to all those uh, who participated today. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have additional questions and anything we can do to support you. That's what BPCA is all about. That's what Heat Smart Tompkins is all about. Uh, as everyone knows, I like to be to the minute, so we'll be uh, ending at 6.02. Take care, everyone. <laughs>